Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Das Mikro. Das Mikro macht schlapp. Ist das gut so? Bitte? I wrote that I have to say good evening to uh, to everybody. I'm very very happy that we are coming uh, together here uh, tonight. So our topic is um, constitutional courts and democracy, and then we have Italy, Israel, Poland, and Hungary. There might be Ukraine too. Um, so as an introduction and uh, for presenting Professor Cartabia, uh, let's for a moment reflect on the topic and the space that we are where we are. So. The uh, DIE is a space where a critical public meets to discuss uh, issues of common concern. That is, that is the, the vocation of this institution. So why are constitutional courts a common concern of a critical public? That, that is uh, to start with. We are not here in a, in a seminar of a law faculty. So these institutions, constitutional courts, are a common concern because of their politicization in the sense that they have become politicization in the sense they have become contentious and the main reason for that contentious politicization is that there is some claim that there is something undemocratic about them that is that is uh, that is the point and that comes in many forms the concern of politicization so let's start with germany in germany we are having a, deb uh, a debate mainly uh, put forward by uh, the Alternative für Deutschland, IFD, but not only, also esteemed colleagues at law faculties, at esteemed law faculties, they are uh, very critical with the court. And just to tell you, there are three main issues. So one, issues, one issue of politicization is uh, that there's a pact between the mainstream parties, the parties that control totally who is a judge at the, at the constitutional court, And there's a pact that excludes the IFD and the Linke from uh, appointing uh, a judge at, uh, to the Constitutional Court. And since they represent almost 25% of the electorate, and since all the judges are uh, decided uh, by the political branch different to, to Italy, perhaps we might come to that. Italy has a different formula. Perhaps we might learn from that. There, there is a, it's a contentious issue. That is one. And then another issue why it is, is contentious in Germany are, and that has been in the press, uh, uh, the dinners. So once in a while, uh, the chancellor invites the court. And so there are dinners at the chancellery between the members, the judges and the government, and they discuss uh, current issues. And people think if that is so good, if the courts are there to control the government, whether it is a good uh, idea that they have uh, uh, private dinners. And then the third issue that led to politicization is that the court um, has a privileged group of journalists. That's the um, Justiz Pressekonferenz. So there's a select group of journalists, and these select group of journalists, they get uh, the information before the other journalists. And of course, uh, these uh, journalists usually are closer to the, uh, to the court, so also that is a, is a, is a contentious uh, issue. And the attack is, the critique is that there is something undemocratic um, about it. Now, at the DIE, it's, um, we don't only discuss German issues. We um, have a focus not just on Germany, but we look, we look abroad. That is in line what an Israeli colleague said, Orna Ben Naftali. She said, uh, Heidelberg is the smallest metropolis of the world. So we have an interest uh, for other places. Um, And indeed, the issue of politicization of courts has been a main issue here at the DIE. We have had two talks on the U.S. Supreme Court. And of course, the U.S. Supreme Court for a long time has been the most important court where all the other courts look to. So it was a trendsetter. Perhaps at the moment it became a trendsetter in a, what most in this room might see as a, as a negative trend. So we had two talks on the uh, American Supreme Court. But of course, that is not enough. So we want to look at other institutions such as Italy, Israel, Poland, and Hungary, and perhaps also uh, Ukraine. So in order to discuss that, I'm very happy that we have Marta Cartabia with us. And that is for four main reasons. The first reason is uh, Marta Cartabia as a scholar. So I 
heard about, I don't know if that is allowed to say, but in the early 90s as an upcoming <laughs> As an upcoming star in Italian uh, constitutional law, so people say that's that's where you should put your money. If it were, uh, uh, if it were, <laughs> um, and so she was breaking old habits, but in a constructive way. So uh, building on what was there, but bringing it to into a new direction. And one of her invention was the relational court. So what is the innovation of a relational court? Well, of course. Mostly when you speak of courts and constitutional courts, it is to have the last word, to have the ultimate say, to be the top dog, to be, it's a very hierarchical thinking. That is how you usually think about courts. And she said, no, no, no. In order to understand how courts operate, both constitutional courts with the domestic judiciary, but also a court with the European judiciary, you should think about it in a relational way. Yeah, so you should not focus on on the court but you should um, you should could look at the at the relation and you should deal with it in a way to constructively uh, manage a, a vital relationship that is uh, that is the thought that they brought and uh, it might be whether that is feminine or feminist uh, constitutional theory but certainly that is a, has been a very important um, issue and it's very important when it comes to democracy because democracy at the end is how an institution relates to, to a people. Then she became, giving truth to those who said, put your money there, <laughs> she became uh, a judge and then also the president of the uh, Italian Constitutional Court. I think you were the first, first women to, yep. to, to, to be there. And, um, and there she also had, had quite an impact. She improved, much improved the, uh, the relationship uh, between the court and the public. So um, the court became a face, the court has a very interesting out, uh, outgoing uh, website. There are post postcards. You can you can see people. So it it became uh, much more accessible for the public. It became also more accessible for people interested. So she introduced the possibility that uh, I have to say the court under her leadership introduced uh, amici curiae briefs. That is to say that people who are not party uh, to the to the procedure have the possibility of in of writing letters to the court. So to bring to the attention of the court issue that perhaps the two parties are not um, uh, do not bring forward, and that is very important because we know that a court is not just deciding a case, but is setting a precedent that will inform many later uh, many later cases. And it also was in her time that the court had to handle the pandemic, which of course was a huge challenge. And since that went well, when uh, her term had finished, there was uh, the Draghi government, you might re uh, remember that, and she became the Minister of Justice in the Draghi uh, government, supported by the probably broadest uh, majority in Italian history. And also there, she had quite an impact. She uh, invested into restorative justice, so meetings between the terrorists and the people who had been killed, or the families of the people who had been killed. That was something new in Europe. We have it in Latin America or in South Africa, but in Europe it's a new thing. Uh, she started giving education and work to the prison population. And she also started uh, a big reform of the judiciary. We know that the judiciary is uh, often very slow in Italy. That's a big problem because access to justice is a, is a core issue. It's a basic human right, so that has much improved. And indeed, in the second year in her term, the Draghi government was voted by the economist uh, as the government of the most promising country uh, of the world. So Italy in, uh, it was 2001, 21? 21. Yeah, it was the country of the year for, uh, for the reforms that the country had uh, introduced. Then when her term finished, she went back to the university, uh, now at Bocconi, but she's also the Italian member at the Venice Commission. The Venice Commission for Democracy Through Law, that is an important body of uh, the Council of Europe that has been set up in the early 1990s and it is there to accompany countries uh, in their process to democracy and currently it's also a body that is in the forefront when it comes to be critical institutionally on what is going on in those countries. So there have been uh, very important statements of the Venice Commission on what was going on in Hungary, what is going on in Poland and those statements have been important then for having a political response, but also for having, um, um, for having a judicial response. So if you see the European courts, when they have to decide issues, 
uh, with those countries, very often they refer to the opinions of the Venice Commission. And uh, Marta Katabi has just delivered an opinion on, or had been the, in the lead for an opinion on the Constitutional Court of Ukraine. And I think that is also an interesting country because somehow uh, Ukraine is standing at the door, but we are not so sure if Ukraine is a constitutional democracy and the working of the Constitutional Court, of course, is a, is a very important uh, piece in that. So that leads to my, um, to my first um, question, and that is to say our general topic Constitutional courts and uh, and democracy, there can be very different relationships. So a court can be very supportive for a constitutional democracy, uh, but it can also be a threat to uh, to constitutional democracy. So there are ver very different uh, possibilities to relate the um, democracy and constitutional courts. And perhaps on the examples that we have, uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, Israel, Italy, and perhaps also Ukraine, you might explain a little bit what is your take on the topic. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much to the director of this institute, uh, to Armin for setting up this uh, fantastic conversation and to all of you for being here tonight. I was wondering who will be coming on June the 20th with the 30 degree outside to speak about constitution and democracy, but the, the room is full of interested people and I re really want to thank you so much for being here and for your attention. Uh, well, let me first start uh, with uh, Israel and uh, Ukraine, two different uh, settings. In Israel, you have people that are in the streets, uh, common people as well as uh, academics and other all sorts of uh, citizens that uh, it is already a number of months that go outside and say we don't want this judicial reform. When, when we speak about judicial reforms, there is always uh, some discontent around, I can tell you, I can't witness. <laughs> but uh, usually it does not affect so much common people. And instead in, in Israel there is something that uh, people fear for, you know, their own sake. There is something that it's a concern that is not interesting also only for the politicians or the academic scholars uh, or some specialized uh, judges or lawyers. It is something for common people. The second uh, image is uh, Ukraine. They are in the middle of the war under the bonds. And the Verkhovna Rada, the Ukraine parliament, is uh, working at a reform that concerns uh, the um, process of appointing and selecting the judges of the Constitutional Court. And they are working to this uh, small, tiny issue already for uh, some six months together with the European Commission, with the Venice Commission and other international actors. And there has been a strong dialogue with the authority, the social, social the, um, civil society and all the rest. So how come that a country in the middle of a war is concerned about the constitutional court? The explanation is that they are thinking to the future of their country, not only to the present. And in the, in the future of that country, one relevant thing is to be able to uh, enter in the European Union. And the European Commission has set a number of conditions to enter in the, in the process of accessing in the European Union. We are still at the first steps. One of these, and probably the most relevant, is uh, concern the neutrality of the Constitutional Court. They want to be sure that the Constitutional Court is a neutral body able to preserve the basic values of the Ukrainian Constitution and the basic values of the European Union. So. Speaking of the, our topic today is not just uh, for uh, a specialized uh, public, but it is for citizens. And these two countries show how important it is. 
and in both countries with different settings, different uh, concerns, but there is a common point. The selection of judges is the most relevant point. Why? Because in the selection of judges, you can decide whether or not the court can play her role of neutral guardian of the Constitution or become politicized. That's, there are many other issues, but the selection is very important. What happened in Hungary and in Poland is exactly that the, the majority in government found a way by means of different reform to replace the judges that were in office and to appoint judges that were more lenient with the government, more close to the political parties of the government so that the constitutional court does not play any more a, a neutral or it's more difficult to, for the constitutional court to, to play her role of the veto power in order to protect the constitutional values. So there is an issue that is common to the two countries. It's the risk of uh, capturing the court or packing the court and with this expression, we refer to the idea of uh, the political majority that is able to control the Constitutional Court, or, the, or at least the majority of uh, its judges. In Israel, there is also a second problem that is taming or curbing the power of the Constitutional Court, but we can uh, go back later to this point. So. The main point is uh, how to select judges. What is the proposal in Israel? In Israel, there, there are so many different uh, ways of appointing judges. There are not one single good way, but the problem is that whatever the way it is, whatever the method is, is chosen, it should be fit for purpose, and the purpose is to have a neutral body in the Constitutional Court. In Israel, the reform that is contested by the people, um, imagine a system where there is a, a, a committee, it is already in this way, there is a committee that is in charge of the task of uh, selecting the judges in the country, a committee made of nine people. So far, it was... Uh, it had a balanced composition. Uh, following this reform, this committee would be uh, under the shadow of the majority of in government, at least for five members out of nine. So the result is that there would be the risk of an indirect control of the majority on all the judges and especially on the Supreme Court judges. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, there is a mixed composition in a way similar to the Italian system that I'm going to explain in a, in a while. Um, there are three appointing bodies. One is the president of the republic uh, in charge of appointing five, five judges. Another is the parliament, other five judges, and uh, the other five are uh, elected by the congress of judges of ordinary judges. The reform that we are discussing for months and that have been the object of three opinions of the Venice Commission and a number of meetings and even a visit of the president of the Venice Commission in Kiev, a, a meeting with Zelensky, so it is something really relevant for the country. Uh, is the role of a, a advisory group of experts that is in charge of the uh, mission of uh, um, so, uh, excluding uh, those candidates uh, to the position of constitutional judge that are not up to the position for professional reasons or for ethical reasons. So there will be uh, these three appointed bodies in Ukraine will be assisted by these advisory bodies, something that happened in the European Court of Justice, uh, uh, the, the Court of Justice of the European Union and also the uh, Court of Human Rights. So these bodies that, uh, you know, select a little bit and give advice, although uh, the appointing bodies are the three that I mentioned. 
in my country, similar to the Ukraine, uh, judges have a mixed composition, a sort of multicolored composition, because uh, there are five members appointed by the President of the Republic, five elected by the Parliament with a qualified majority, and five elected by the Supreme Courts, uh, the Corte di Cassazione, Conseil d'État, and the Court of, Colors, uh, of Count. I think that this, this, uh, this system is a very good one. Why it is a very good one? First, because it has proved to uh, be able to um, offer a diverse composition, at least from for the cultural point of view. It's not was not so good for selecting and balancing the gender, for example, that was not a the strong point of my court. Uh, but this idea of having different sources selecting the judges is a very good one because, let's put it in this way, we want to reach neutrality. Uh, I learned from my son that uh, studies both arts that we have two neutral colors in the spectrum. One is black and the other is white. Black is neutral because of the lack of any color, the lack of any light. White is neutral because it encompasses all the colors of the spectrum. So in my view, it is much more realistic to reach this neutrality with a plus rather than with a minus, uh, with a uh, sum rather than we, with a deduction. And uh, I think that this is something that we have to try to pursue in uh, our countries. Uh, these courts uh, do not have a a political legitimation is not a matter of uh, electing bodies that represent all the parties in uh, in the country but it is a matter of pluralism of diversity of having a number of voices within the court so that their decision can be really the um, the reflects the mirror of different voices in the society and when I say diversity, pluralism, different voices, I refer not only to political inclination, but also to cultural diversity from the region from where they come in the country. For me, it's very important that all the countries are represented in a way or is not homogeneously chosen in on, only in one part male and female or gender balance in any case, uh, generation of scholars and so on. It is not a matter of uh, political representation, but a different kind of legitimacy based on pluralism and multicultural vision. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, if you give such an uh, important role to, uh, to constitutional courts in the political life of a country, that there's an implicit understanding that democracy is more than that the majority decides. And that is a very important argument because, uh, for example, in, in Israel, uh, the people and a lot of people really want the court to be curt. It is said that Netanyahu would be happy to leave it as it is, but it is that uh, in the country, uh, there are a lot of people who really want to curb that court because they say it has, uh, uh, we, are the, uh, we are the majority and we want that the country runs in the way that uh, that we, the majority, wants it. So you imply that that is not in a proper understanding of democracy. Could you elaborate on that? Thank you so much for this question, Armin, because uh, it, I think that this is a question uh, very common in the public debate, in the people, and very common in a number also of scholars. Uh, you know, the counter-majoritarian argument uh, since the, the study of John Hartili, it was the 80s, I think, uh, how come that few people 
can decide to stop the decision of the majority? Who are these 8, 10, 15 men and women that have more power than the majority of the country? Well, this requires go a little bit deeper in the notion of democracy. We are in constitutional democracies, not majoritarian democracies. And this is something that we decided that, that after what we learned from history. Our history, our country's history, especially in Europe, taught us that majority can do wrong and can do badly wrong. And so after World War II and w w all the things that happened before, we decided to follow the example of the American Constitution, that is to secure some principles, some basic principles and values in a higher law, in a more rigid text in the Constitution, which is not a common piece of legislation, is something different, is something that cannot be amended or changed by the simple will of the majority, but requires a complex, even too much rigid procedure in some cases, because we don't want to easily dismiss or infringe or violations of these relevant principles, starting with human dignity, the fundamental rights of people, the uh, separation of powers, the independence of the judiciary, and all the rest. And we, especially Germany, but also the other countries followed, went even farther than that we decided that some of these principles should be considered as eternal. The eternity closes. There is something that nobody can repeal. When I entered my first class year uh, of constitutional law, I often ask the students, uh, would, you be, would you consider as democratic as a decision taken, let's say, not by the majority, by the two-thirds of the parliament, or even the 90% of the parliament, and then confirmed by a referendum with a, a, a huge support of the common people saying that we are going to abolish freedom of speech. Is this democratic? If you take the idea of a de democracy as the majority rule, you are bound to say yes. But there is something uncomfortable with that. And that's exactly the reason why, after World War II, there is a richer at least in Europe and in other countries, especially the United States was even before us, a richer notion of democracy, which is constitutional democracy, meaning that there is a domain of the Constitution that is, should be taken, shielded from the hands and the powers of the majority, and there is the domain of politics, which is the space where the government can rule the country. In my view, this is something that I would say, do not repeat the obvious. But nowadays we have to repeat the obvious because, or restate the obvious, because in a common debate, this is, these are concepts that are, that, you know, that are not that clear in the uh, common mm, wording and and, uh, and the, the common dialogue that we have about this kind of issues. And that is the root because the, the, the root where uh, the critiques against constitutional court starts because we have an idea, maybe not explicit, but an implicit idea that democracy means that the majority can do whatever is in their preferences. Before I continue, 
Is it okay with you I take off my jacket? Sure. <laughs> you know why I will ask you the same. <laughs> I take advantage of this moment to add uh, one thing. Uh, in the opening of the Italian Constitution, Article 1 reads, the sovereignty belongs to the people that exerts it in the forms and within the limits of the Constitution. This is the definition of democracy that we that opens the Italian the Italian text in the forms and within the limits. It's not that because it is the people and the majority of the people that decides can be do whatever in the forms in the limits. I think that this is a, a nice uh, wording of the idea of constitutional democracy. Uh, thank you. Yet, in order to continue. My next question is from where the critique comes. And uh, we see an interesting phenomenon that today most of the critique is mostly coming from, uh, from um, uh, conservative or rather to say right-wing parties. And that is something new. If we remember uh, the most important book that has been written probably in the 20th century on constitutional courts in Europe, that is, uh, uh, has been a French author, Edouard Lambert, And he wrote in 1921, Le gouvernement, le, le gouvernement des juges, so it's the government of judges, et la lutte contre la législation sociale aux États-Unis. And so it was uh, the government of the judges and the fight against social legislation in the United States. So uh, Lambert, uh, who was also one of the people who has founded uh, comparative uh, constitutional law, he looked at the situation there and he saw um, uh, a line of cases that uh, culminated in the in the famous Lochner case, it's Lochner. which demolished that, which um, uh, went against social legislation. And so, uh, so what Lambert said: if you want to have, uh, if you want to have true democracy, if you want to have social justice, if you want to have social protection, don't have a constitutional court because consti courts, and particularly constitutional courts, they are inherently conservative. And so they will strike down whatever you have as, as conservative, uh, co uh, progressive legislation. So don't do that. And that was very influential. Uh, only after World War II, constitutional legislation started in, uh, in actually then in, in Italy and Germany. It was still a very small group. And that it really took off, it was the 80s and the 90s. So it's a, it's a very recent phenomenon. Uh, and the fear was from progressive forces that then conservative judges would thwart progressive projects. And now if we look at the critique, it comes from the other side. So um, the, that is the case in Israel, that is the case in, uh, in, in Poland, that is, has been the case in Hungary. So they say these courts, they are a progressive liberal international elite and they are imposing on a conservative, on a conservative majority values and, and ways of living that is not shared by, uh, by the people. So there, Uh, something has uh, changed and uh, what, is, what is your reasoning why that has happened and why the critique has changed sight? So from the historical point of view it's very interesting because it's true that uh, this book by Lambert was really very influential and it was even in the discussion of the Italian Constituent Assembly and was uh, often here now uh, it, it, it was continuously quoted in order to say pay attention not to build up this uh, new institution what is a judge that can stop the parliament and uh, in the end the, co the constitutional court was uh, envisaged in the constitution but still that debate was so strong that uh, it took some more than eight years to implement an essential institution envisaged in the Constitution. The Constitution is of 1948, and the first decision of the Constitutional Court was 1956. Eight years later is not a small period of time, and it was on purpose. There were resistance. Those who were in power in that moment didn't want to have somebody, you know, revising the decision taken by the parliament or the government. Um, I think that in this discussion, 
there are two different sets of arguments that overlap. One is the way you, you frame it, the conservative versus the progressive. Now the fear is that the courts are too much progressive or liberal, and so we have to stop this progressive body. I can explain, I, I would like to slightly change the, to, in order to better understand the, the reason of this objection, because we have to take seriously this kind of objection. My feeling is that uh, uh, we have to fear equally a conservative or a progressive court. We need a neutral court in the sense that I mentioned before. But the reason that brought the discussion to this point is much has much more to do with the, let's use the expression by Mauro Cappelletti, who was an Italian uh, fantastical comparative uh, scholar, li Italian, but living the most part of his life in the United States, that already in the 60s and the 70s spoke about the rise of the judiciary. What did it mean about the rise of the judiciary? If we go back to the origin of constitutionalism in the 19th century, the judiciary was described as a null power, a power that was irrelevant because the role was simply to apply the law. Uh, Montesquieu said the bouche de la loi, Hamilton said the least dang dangerous branch. Uh, referring to the fact that this kind of power is simply to uh, enforce what has been decided in a different place by the politicians, and so why should we fear this power has no, uh, the arms has no, the enforcement powers, and so it's, uh, it's irrelevant. Nowadays, many things have changed. And a huge number of political questions has been, have been brought in front of courts, especially constitutional court or Supreme Court. There has been a judicial Judicialization, how can I say it, of political questions. For example, a number of uh, uh, divisive uh, or controversial issues uh, concerning uh, new rights, uh, uh, bioethical issues uh, are brought in front of the court. Uh, the politics uh, does not want to engage that much in this kind of decision, and so it is the court, at least in my country, it was the, this way or in the European courts to decide for uh, the right to die or, in any case, the, the issues concerning the end of life uh, or the beginning of life uh, or abortion uh, or the new sets of the families. It, this difficult and very uh, in, in issues where the society has changed so much very often have been um, decided by courts. And that's why the power or the authority of the competence of, of court can no longer be described as a null power or the least dangerous branch. But also on other issues, who could have imagined, for example, for the constitutional court to be called to decide about the electoral legislation of the parliament. It is something that usually we consider to be up to the parliament to decide the way of election. And we can give a huge number of examples. So in my view, the reason why uh, courts are becoming so at the center of the concerns is not so much because uh, uh, they are liberal or they are conservative, but the issue is that uh, are they working within the limits and in the border of what is their domain or are they are taking also the role of the politics? In my view, it's much more 
judicial activism and judicial minimalism or uh, rather than conservative or liberal uh, liberal court and in my view this is a question that is always to be asked when you are a judge when you are taking a decision am i doing just my job or i'm stepping you know over uh, the limits and uh, uh, intruding into the domain of politics. And I think that there are some way of deciding. I have in mind a special one case, if I can explain one moment, in the Constitutional Court, there was a very difficult case. It was about assisted suicide in Italy. Uh, we had a provision in the criminal code uh, criminalize all sort of assisted suicide. It was an, an old norm that uh, was very severe, and rightly so, that because it's there are there can be vulnerable people that can be induced to to lose their life uh, for many reasons. The case was brought in front of the court. Uh, asking and in, in, a, in an issue of this very unfortunate and uh, sad uh, situation where a person is in a way trapped in a, a sick body, ill body with a lot of suffering that cannot bring, does not bring him immediately to die, but uh, for long years can become a source of suffering. So the request was made to the Constitutional Court to carve out uh, a, a, an area in this criminal provision say that in certain cases, under certain conditions, assisted suicide is not uh, punishable. You can imagine, very controversial, difficult decision to be taken by a court. And uh, that, in that case, the court uh, really, with the move of cre creativity, um, decided to and inspired by some uh, comparative experience. I don't know if uh, Germany was also the case, but it was uh, sure in the mind of the court, Austria, Canada and others and the United Kingdom said, hold on, we will stop our process, our procedure, and we will ask the parliament take a decision on this issue, to elaborate a piece of legislation, a procedure with all the guarantees and all the rest in, all, in order to face this kind of situations that cannot be assimilated as such to other form of assisted suicide. And it was new. And in, in the spirit of the court, it was the idea of uh, giving the first say to the parliament uh, on this delicate issue without uh, dismissing the role of guardian of the constitution, saying if the parliament does not decide in one year, then the court has to close. Because this is the difference, uh, one of the difference between a court and a parliament. Parliament and the political body bodies can decide not to decide and is perfectly legitimate. The court cannot. Once it is addressed by a case and the case is filed into the court, the court has to answer. And this is a big difference. In my view, I make this example. I know that it has been controversial. It has been criticized um, by many parties, uh, scholars, and so on. But in my view, this kind of decision are the kind of decision that uh, uh, show that the court is aware of the limits of her role and that want to preserve the space uh, of the democratic game and the, of the political sphere. And I think that uh, in my country, as well as uh, in Germany, I know from uh, Laura Herring that helped me so much in this day that we have in all our courts uh, and case law of our courts, uh, cases in which we can list the attitude of the constitutional court 
helping, supporting the proper functioning of the democratic process. They are not enemies. They are alliance and they can cooperate. I think that that's the relational court, <laughs> the, the way to find the possibility, uh, each one in its own domain, but also cooperating is a good way out in order to reply to this very serious objection. We do not want uh, conservative courts or liberal courts. We want uh, guardians of the constitutions. Okay. So I think then uh, we come uh, we come to the end. So again, thank you very much for coming here. I'm so thank you. Thank you.